All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to yet another workshop, poetry workshop for us here at SMC. This one is all about reading poetry out loud. So last time we were together, we were writing poetry and we did share out loud some of the time, but this time we're gonna focus a bit on how we share out loud and what that feels like um, and what that sounds like. And even though we say read poetry out loud, pre presenting poetry isn't just an out loud thing, right? There are poets who aren't verbal necessarily and they share poetry through sign or they share poetry through multimedia presentations. There are all kinds of ways to share poetry. This is just one of them, uh, but the confidence that we hope we get from this workshop and the inspiration we hope we get from this workshop will inspire us to go forward and share poetry in whatever ways feel most comfortable for us. Okay, uh, this event, Find Your Voice Poetry Read Out Loud workshop is presented to you by SMC Library and the English Department. So before we go forward, let me have our dear librarian, Roxana, introduce herself, and then we're going to have more of our English faculty introduce themselves. We have Regis Peoples here. Let's have you all introduce yourselves, please. Sure. Thank you, Bridget. Hi, everybody. My name is Roxana, and I'm one of the new librarians at SMC. I'm so happy to be working with Bridget and Regis on this project, as well as Diane, who's not here today. Um, hopefully, this is um, something that will lead us to more collaborations together. Um, so we'll see what this brings. But thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, hey, I'm, my name is Regis Peoples. I am um, English faculty. Um, I love poetry. I'm a poet. And um, yeah, this should be really fun. Um, and hopefully it will help you, you know, as Bridget was saying, in other with other aspects of your life and communicating, um, especially when you really, you know, consider tone and focusing in. But we'll talk about that stuff later. Yes. And just so you all know, Roxana is the brainchild behind all of this. This was her idea. OK. And so we're hoping that maybe she might share a poem today. I'm just saying peer pressure is on, okay? <laughs> and we hope that the rest of you also get a chance to share it. Thank you so much. And I know that some of us were here last time together, but if you want to now, please introduce yourselves in the chat so we know who's here. And we know if you're coming from a particular department or if you're a student or faculty or staff or a community member who wants to take part, go ahead in the chat and introduce yourselves, please. Thank you so much. All right, so let's go to our next slide. What do you do in a poetry workshop? This is a reminder, right? In a poetry workshop, we learn poetry writing techniques, and in this case, also poetry reading techniques, and we write our own poetry, we share our own poetry, and we receive and give feedback. And most importantly, we have fun. It's really important to think about receiving and giving feedback because you're not just in a space presenting your thing and getting back this critique from a panel of judges, you are a part of a poetry community now and the community is engaged in this conversation. So uh, let's go to our first thing of the day, okay? Which I know you're all looking forward to, writing, okay? So for today's purposes, if you have poetry from before that you would like to share, that's absolutely okay. But to get us kind of loose and limber here, let's do a little quick write, okay? We have two quick write options, okay? You can write a poem where the last words of each line are the first words of the following line, right? So for example, if I say, the first words of each line are the last words of the following line. And then I begin the next st statement and say, um, line your words up perfectly and you'll have the best poem, right? If I begin that next line with the word line, then I'm, I'm kind of following that kind of echoing uh, feeling or it could be a fuller phrase. It doesn't have to be just one word. Um, and the second option is to write a poem where every line or stanza begins with the same word or phrase. OK, um, and so this is a bit of repetition, right? So maybe you write a poem where every line begins with I am or we are, or maybe every line begins with sometimes I wonder or sometimes I wander, right? Uh, but some way where we get a bit of repetition at every line or at the top of every stanza. And for folks who don't know, a stanza is a unit of poetry. It's kind of like a paragraph in poetry. It's one unit by itself when we kind of break the poems up into stanzas. So let's try a bit of work here when it comes to repetition. We're going to take just a few minutes to work on this. I think we can take about 
until about 11.35 with this one. So that gives us a good 15 minutes to work on this. Uh, we're gonna stop the recording while you all are working. And then when you come back, if you would like to share, we'll also have the recording pause so you can share openly and not worry about other people necessarily hearing your first draft. But if you wanna share on camera and you wanna share on mic, please do. Even if we're not recording, we still wanna hear from you and possibly see you too. All right, so let's go ahead and pause that recording. I guess I should, should hit share screen first, huh? Bridget, let's remember that. <laughs> hit share screen first. Okay, here we go. So all we've talked about just now, it really fits these three tips, okay? Um, things to consider when sharing poetry aloud. Tone, do you want to use a neutral tone or be more animated, right? Uh, will every poem have the same tone or will they vary? And this is a really big one as a poet myself, I, I, re I read poetry all the time. I got a book, I, I do all these things. And sometimes I feel like, I think this poem sounds like audibly just like the last poem. What can I do differently? It's not just my voice that sounds the same. It's maybe the, the cadence I'm using. All that kind of feels similar or maybe the tone has the same uh, uh, um, feeling and maybe the poems fit well together for that reason, right? So acknowledging tone uh, can be a really big part uh, of reading a poem. We also think about rhythm, right? And so do you sense any rhythms and or patterns? Do you feel something happening rhythmically um, or see any patterns happening in your work? And how can you play on those things, right? Do you wanna emphasize that repetition? Do you wanna emphasize that rhythm, that sound, that rhyme, right? Um, how do you wanna play uh, and again, play is a, a really important part of this. How do you want to play with those words? Okay. And last but not least, uh, pacing, which we talked about, a lot about um, in our, our workshop so far, you know, how fast or slow would you like to share your poem? What makes the poem most accessible? So uh, Professor Reed just said, hey, you slow down a poem that's a little bit shorter, give your reader a chance, your listener a chance to kind of sit with it. Maybe there's comfortability or uncomfortability when it comes to silence. Uh, maybe when it comes to emphasis at the end of a line, kind of pacing yourself for maybe a, a longer poem or one that's just more uh, vocabulary dense when it comes to diction, things like that. Maybe that can go a bit faster to kind of, um, so the reader can kind of catch the, or listener can catch the pace and the rhyme and the rhythm and the, and the changes and scheme that are happening. Um, but maybe if your poem is something that has a tone that is supposed to kind of pull people in and be really welcoming, maybe that's a more conversational uh, pace, right? So these are three things to keep in mind. And you can keep these things in mind for any kind of writing and any kind of sharing, not just poetry. And can I say two other things really quick? Hit it. Uh, so now in regards to uh, what Bridget was discussing when it comes to rhythm and, you know, poems sounding the same, but having different language and maybe being stuck in a pattern, uh, there are a couple things you can do or some experimental things as well to try. One thing is to remember that your voice is an instrument. So if you've ever played an instrument, you can use all of those same uh, technique based things that you've learned like crescendo and decrescendo and staccato and you can do all those same things with your voice your voice is an instrument right so that's the one thing and if you listen to music consider your favorite or different genres that you like um, and consider how you can simulate those through the cadence and diction of your poems because then you don't have to think about what should I do just try to imitate real pre-existing music and you'll find that you'll actually unlock some things the other thing is there are these activities called somatic exercises. Now, obviously everything has a spectrum and you might find something crazy. I'm talking about the regular stuff, all right? So one example is, um, and the goal is basically get yourself out of your everyday pattern. If every day you go home at five o'clock and you sit down and you write a poem at your desk, you're probably gonna write something similar every time because you're in the same simulation. So what happens if you wake up in the morning and instead you do a, ha a headstand and write your poem upside down? or maybe you eat all green foods all day and see if something different happens to you. Maybe you try something different at the grocery store you've never eaten and you write a poem about it. Well, now you're training your brain to have new experiences and with new experiences and you know executions come new type of writing, if that makes sense. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that in there. And that That's comes from uh, C.A. Conrad, by the way, who is a, a great poet. Thank you. No, that makes complete sense. Maybe try something different, just one small shift. Even with it, like Reed just said, maybe you write your poem upside down or maybe you write in a different notebook. Maybe you type it instead of writing it. Maybe you dictate it to yourself on your phone's you know, notes app. Maybe you write a line on one sheet and then tear it up 
right? And move the letters around, do something that feels a bit different. I think that's why prompts are fun and also scary because they ask you to do something that you don't normally do, right? It gets you out of your comfort zone. And once you're out of your comfort zone, you might surprise yourself. And it's always good to surprise yourself when it comes to poetry, always. That's really great advice. Thanks, Regis. All right, so other things to think about. All we've been talking about really here is a bit of like preparation, right? When you're writing a piece or preparing to share a piece, there are three things I want you to consider, okay? And they're not three things alone, but they're three pretty big things, right? Consider your audience. Who is your audience? And I mean, the audience for your piece, many of you teach literature, so you know that the audience, the intended audience could be one set of readers and the, you know, actual audience in your classroom, another set of readers. And so how do we understand, you know, what the uh, intended audience was expecting and things like that. But I mean, like your literal audience, the people in front of you, the people listening to you, the people watching the recording, what do they need, right, to fully understand and access your work. So accessibility is not just um, you know, things that we do only when we know that someone has a need, right? We kind of, we preemptively think of what people might need. We think of the fact that maybe folks are in the room and the room doesn't have a mic, right? And when it comes to setting, right? Maybe I'm at the front and they're in the back and I'm a very quiet reader, but I want the folks in the back to hear me. What do I need to do to make sure they hear me? Maybe I need to move physically through the room to get maybe more toward the middle, right? So they, they can hear me. Maybe I need to project my voice or practice doing that before I go in, right? And so thinking about your audience and thinking about your setting are these really tactile, really tangible things that you can imagine. Now, sometimes, honestly, you will show up to a poetry event and not know who your audience is going to be. You don't know who's going to be there. You don't know the kind of setting, you know, you go in and kind of and have to figure it out on your own. But if you're thinking about that in your preparation, maybe you have a few, you know, tricks up your sleeve, right? And then last but not least, obviously, think about yourself. What do you need to confidently share your work? How will you prepare yourself? I'm a person, I love to practice, right? And Regis has shared the same. I like to share my work out loud when I'm writing it, after I write it immediately, come back to it later, practice it different ways. I like to practice sharing out loud just so that I'm more comfortable, right? And obviously being on a stage or being in front of a mic or being on Zoom, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? It's a little nerve wracking, but if you feel confident in your work and you feel confident in yourself, it will shine through. Or you can lean into the nerves, right? We just said in the chat a little bit before, lean into that anxiety, right? Be honest, be, ver be vulnerable, be open with the people around you that are listening to you that this is your first time. You're not really sure what you're doing if you're doing it right. And, you know, have that, let that kind of shine through a bit and it, cause it's very human. And um, I think it could actually really work and, and help. So with um, that said, hit me, Regis. I was going to say one other thing. Yes, just remember, it's okay to be nervous. Every time when I do a reading, I've done at least 7,000 readings and I always feel the same every time. Just mm -hmm. like every time I'm going to do a lesson in my classroom, doesn't matter how long I've been teaching, I, it's okay. I just embrace it because if you don't, you might get distracted by it. So just accept yourself, just like you hope people accept your work. Um, and the other thing is, Consider writing like a reader and reading like a writer. One thing that may help you read out loud is actually formatting on the page your poem in a way that teaches the reader how to read it. And in doing so, you're creating a map key for yourself. So when you do read, you don't have to think as much. How do I want to say this word? When should I pause? How do I want to read this right now? Well, format it in a way that shows you that from the get-go, and then you have less thinking to do while reading, then you can focus on your voice. All right? Yes. This is something that we we don't talk enough about, but the way you break your lines, the space visually you give yourself on a page, all that can influence how you read. And I like to script my poems if I'm going to read them out loud. I might write a note to myself, pause here, breathe here, slow down. I might break the word up phonetically on the page just to remind myself to really emphasize the word, right? Because it's for me. And it's a little script and it helps me. I do the same thing with lecture, right? When I first got started, I'm like, when, how, when do they ask questions? I just, I keep talking. <laughs> and so I make a script, right? So I, I know when I want to stop and pause and give, give the audience a chance to, to jump in. So absolutely, that kind of preparation can definitely help. So we have a choice. I'm going to stop share really quickly here so I can see all of you. Here's our choice. Would you like to write a bit more 
or would you like to see some examples of poets sharing? We can always give you these links in the chat, but I kind of think we could write a bit more. Just personally, I would love to hear it, see you write a bit more and then hear you share a bit more. So I'll give you the choice because we're, in, we're, in, we're doing good work here and I don't want to slow us down. So let's take a vote <laughs> by show of smiles. <laughs> Who would like to take some time to write a bit more? <laughs> I got the big smile. I'm, I'm excited either way. I'm excited either way. Anybody? Uh-oh. What do you think? Roxy, Regis, what do you think? We're split. I think, can we can we do half and half? Okay. And maybe let's, do like a shorter piece of writing or something like that. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So I'm going to show you two quick partial examples of two different poets reading poems very differently. Okay, and then you are going to write a bit. Cool. All right. Back to the share screen here. I just want to make sure I like to give choices. I'm all about choices. All right. So this first example is actually, I think I'm going to save Edwin because the poem is a little bit longer. This first example is from Douglas Kearney, and he's a Los Angeles based poet. So you might have even seen him out. And if you've seen him out, then you know he rocks the mic. Okay, I'm going to show a bit of that. And I'm going to give you another bit from another Los Angeles based poet. So uh, let me. Thank you, Tyba, for bringing me here. Thank you all for being here. I'll, I'll get started. I'm about to do a piece called Show. And the only thing you need to know about this piece is it's from a form invented by a student of mine. The student's name is Indigo Weller. And the form is called a Torchon. Some need some body or more to ape sweat on some site. Bloody pearl or dirty spit hocked up for to show who gets eaten. Rig body up, bow, bow to breeze a lazed jig and sway to Griggs good fiddling. Pine deep dusk, a spot where stood body. Thus they clap when I mount bonk, jig up the lectern, bow to say it's all good. We gathered, withstood the bends of dives, deeper, darker. They clap as I get down. Sweat highlights my body. How meats died bloody. Look fresher for show. Ing, I got deep. Spit out my mouth. A rigid ride, rind, bloody melon. Ha! No sweat. Joking, nobody knows the trouble. Rig full of dance. Show one fix this mess. Spit in tragedy's good eye. This one's called Jig Gogglers, then bow housefully. They clap. Be misunderstood. Hang notes high or deep. Make my tongue a bow. What's the gift? My good song box? The gift. Jiggle nickels from deep down my craw. They clap. I so jolly stood on that bank, buddy picked over blood e rato Braxton sweat e brow syndrome spit out a sax bell rig a negrocious show of feels for show sweat equals work bloody ink pot of body I stay nib dipped show never run dry rig Rigorously, I spit out stressed feet, lines jig, ha 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 ha, good one that I is, bow, deep but not out, stood shining, dim, they clap, waves slapping hull. Pause. <laughs> I know you are in it. I know you are in it. Uh, Roxy's going to drop a link to this video in the chat. Um, that's Douglas Kearney. And Douglas Kearney has a style all his own, okay? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> all his own. What do you notice about his reading of, of, of this piece show? What do you notice? What stands out to you in his reading of it? His whole body is, is speaking. Mm -hmm. Right. He embodies the poem. And all we can see are his shoulders and up, <laughs> right? But we can, we can almost imagine, right, that his whole body's moving, right? Anybody else, what stands out to you about his reading of this piece? It's a performance and fantastic uh, diction also. The way he pronounced the pauses between every single word and you just hear that. And there's, there's just, just this the rhythm that sucks you in. Right. 
because one thing about this poem in particular, reading it has a very similar, it's a very, there's a very similar experience while reading it, but um, hearing it, you're not so much worried about maybe what he's saying at every single line, but you feel it, right? It feels visceral. Anybody else? I know Regis is a big fan of Douglas Kearney, so I picked, I picked this on purpose. What do you think, Regis? You know, last time I saw him, I said, look, man, I'm trying to get like you, right? Um, and one thing to kind of take what Lana and Lauren have said and put it together, it is a performative piece where there is clear diction and he's embodying the poem, but he's also simulating these characters when he's mm -hmm. changing voices. So as he changes characters, he changes his body language to match the aesthetic of that character, whether it's a black minstrel show character or a stereotypical, you know, racist archetype of whatever it means it is. And, you know, he's referencing the Negro spirituals and talking about work and effort. He is basically showing the different facades within the layer of the conversation. And I think that that's one thing he does really well performatively. Um, and, you know, while keeping his voice clear and articulating all the words uh, there, you know, he, he just it's a different thing. Right. Even with that drama, there's still a level of, of accessibility to the reader and to the audience. Right. The audience can listen. Right. They might be distracted a bit and like, oh, that's so exciting. He's moving. He's shaking. His voice is changing. But there's it's 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 um, still accessible. Right. Um, it still feels like you experience something. And when you leave it, maybe you don't have every question answered right about what the poem was about, things like that. But, you know, something was happening and you're intrigued enough to go back and watch again. Thank you for that. So I'm going to look at one more piece here. This is another Los Angeles based poet who reads a little bit differently, okay? This is V. Kali. V. Kali is a poet from the World Stage Gallery Space. She hosts a weekly um, workshop there and often shares. And she is a, you know, just a person who's been around the LA lit scene for a very long time. And she reads a little differently than Douglas Kearney. How dare you love me like you mean it? Honoring your intention, you bring laughter to my heart and my cup runneth over and over again. Because of you, I live in a place where the scent of star lilies and white roses. We negotiate air. Handle me like, baby, I'm free. Okay, okay. I know I asked Spirit for this. Just didn't know we would be here so soon. A bucket full of brothers got me flashing like railroad crossing. How dare you love me like God sent you? Just cause he did. <laughs> Told you things I ain't admitted to myself. Told you's so you could help me heal. This is what love looked like from the inside of a spirit who says you mine all the time, of a God that love you like always ain't never been defined, just is. Don't you know I ain't used to this? But when you open your heart, your eyes will follow and lead you to me every time. How dare you love me like I deserve it. Watch me let you. All right, that's a quick one. So in hearing that one, and thank you, Roxy, for dropping that in the chat. What about her recitation? What, is, what does she sound like? What did you notice about her piece? Her piece was shorter, right? But what did you notice? Maybe in her pace and in her, her intentions here. I, I noticed, I believe, or at least I experienced this, that she became more open and more available to the audience as the poem progressed. At the beginning, she kind of was looking down at the podium and being kind of quiet. And as the poem opened, she did. And she really, it kind of changed throughout. She, it changed the way she started and the way she ended. Yes. The poem grew. Yeah. And she became more vulnerable, even opening yeah. up to us. A very vulnerable poem. Absolutely. Great observation. Anyone else? What about her pacing? I like the pauses she took. 
yeah where you're she's quiet and then she starts up again um because it allows you to sort of take that in what she's saying absolutely and they weren't particularly um a quiet bunch there right? people were clapping and making noise so she had to pause at some points but at other points there was kind of like a little bit of a quiet right of okay sit with that for a moment now obviously both of these poets are experienced poets and they read all the time and they have to make choices and it's easy to see them and say oh their examples are so good i don't know i mean what do i do do i do that Mm -hmm. It's a bit of what Richard said, right? It's like, okay, well, what do I see happening successfully? Do I want to try that on for size, right? Maybe not the full garment. Maybe I'm not go. Maybe I don't go fully into character voices, or maybe I don't give all the pauses. But there's something about them sharing their work in a way that's very um, different from each other. That I, maybe I could try some of this. Maybe I could be a bit more dramatic or add more pauses or things like this, right? And so we're going to also share with you all some other links as well. Um, I have a PDF uh, uh, for, for this presentation where you can look at other poets also sharing all very different, um, all very different approaches to poetry. Uh, but now it's your turn. Aha. Yes, I did not forget. We are writing. Okay, so this is going to be the quickest write of quick writes. Okay, we're going to take just about, let's say, let's do five minutes because all I want from you is to go back to a previously written poem, maybe one that you wrote earlier and play around a bit of what Regis said, play around with your line breaks and your spacing and really breaking the poem down in a way that can help you read it differently or try something different. Um, or write a poem that asks the question and then answers it. It asks the question and then it answers it. And I'm just gonna throw a link to a Philip Larkin poem in the chat called Days, because I think it's the perfect example of a poem that asks a question and answer it if you just wanna ponder and maybe look at it really quick to give you some inspiration. Yes. So let's try to go and tell about, oh, I'll say, let's go tell about, let's take 10 minutes. Let's take 10 minutes, we got time. Let's take about 10 minutes until 1225 to, to work on this one, okay? I'm going to mute myself and go off camera, but I'll be in the chat. We're gonna pause the recording now while you all are working. And then let's come back and share. Zoom here. Let's take a look really quickly because I got a couple of questions. I wanna to get to that here. We do have an event coming up next week in case you have to leave a little early. We have an event coming up next week, a spoken word event where we wanna hear from you. We would like you to come and share your poetry. Uh, it's an open mic. It's open to faculty, staff, students, community members. So register for the Zoom and come on in and join us, okay? And we'll have that link in the chat for you as well, but you can also find it on the library website as well as SMC's calendar of events. And as a reminder, we do teach creative writing here at SMC. This fall, we have several sections of English 30A, which is beginning creative writing. Uh, that that co course covers everything from poetry writing to fiction writing. I teach courses in it. Diane Ariel, we just met last uh, week, teaches courses in it. We have tons of instructors who love to do creative writing here. And if you've already taken 30A, you can definitely go on to take 30B. And we're also working on hopefully having a more expansive uh, creative writing workshop experience, things that focus primarily on poetry, nonfiction, fiction, you know, different things like that. So if you're interested, definitely make sure you check out um, our English department and make sure that you're getting into these classes. Take these classes with us. Let's keep this thing going. And if you want to have more workshops like this, please let us know. We would love to have more open workshops for everyone on campus. It's been a really great experience. I'm very happy that Roxy created this idea because we can do it again, not just in April. All right. So um, anyway, let's uh, jump back in and get into our sharing. All right. So I'm going to read through the poems first and I'll talk to you quickly about sort of my process and what I'm thinking about. So I'll try to give you three different types of pieces here. Uh, the first one is called Rapture. <clears throat> I die every time I see you. The first time we. All right, so now I'm gonna read the second poem. All right, and we'll talk about it after. This poem is called 12 Words. If I could write about sorrows, I wouldn't have wasted 12 words. Okay, very short. Now I'll read something a little bit longer, a little bit more of my style, but you know, I am more so of a 
I don't know how to explain it, but you know, I, I like to have a lot of rhythm and musicality. But th this one, I'd like this one here. This one's for y'all, okay? It's called Drinking Gourd. The columny of color warms in wakes of wickedness. Frail droplets merging as tempest, strolling storms, winking with weakness. Two hands tracing grace into a face. Now, with me, drink the stars. Slowly, slower, slow enough to numb these tears as dank and dark as oil, slow enough to feel something familiar or unfamiliar. So, usually I do like a whole bunch of rapping, bobbing my thingy, my jigs, all right? But rapture, right? I wanted to sort of use the silence to my advantage. And that's something that I always use to start off certain readings because it does get the crowd comfortable with silence and it gets them on their toes to think, okay, this person is doing some conceptual things. So it's sort of a brain warm up, right? Um, and obviously the poem stops because I saw them, so I die because I die every time I see them. So I'm creating a binary as well, right? Um, and I don't need to write the rest, it's implied. You can use figurative language outside of actually writing it. I can imply something through not writing anything at all, right? Um, the other thing, 12 words. Well, first off, the poem is 12 words, right? And the poem is about how I don't have words to waste to write something. So I wasted 12 words to say that if I had these words, then there would be something else. But since I don't, this is what I have, right? So less conceptual, more technical and based in logic and logos, right? Now, the drinking gourd, you know, this is all a sort of about trauma in history. Um, and it's a part of a series that I'm doing about, you know, the Atlantic Ocean. And I, I have this setting where there's a disembodied Afro on a boat traveling across the Atlantic and sort of interacting with ancestors. Uh, so when I'm discussing the columny of color and the wakes of wickedness, I'm referring to the ocean. Uh, the frail droplets merging as tempest is the storm of those who were lost in the whole transatlantic slave trade um, and things of that nature. And they are the strolling storms that are winking with weakness um, because there's sometimes is this conversation, you know, about, well, anyways, the point is I don't want to go through the whole poem, but what I'm thinking about in these moments is, you know, how can I use nature and relatable things to have conversations that maybe are outside of people's understanding, or maybe they don't have as much context as me. So if I want to give a history lesson without actually giving a history lesson, it's going to start with the setting and it's going to start with the title because the title is the first thing that's gonna really give you that deeper information. I say drinking gourd, if people make those semiotic connections, then now we have a you know social context for the poem. And then there's less explanation I have to do and less name dropping and less dates and all of those sorts of things. And I can focus solely on the imagery of the numbness, the feelings of familiarity, the idea of storytelling, and this idea of you know two hands tracing grace into a face and sort of you know connecting with maybe Phyllis Wheatley or folks who were having, you know, these religious conversations, you know, through enslavement, if that makes sense at all. Uh, so I'm kind of considering, how do I not lecture, basically? I'm an instructor, and it's easy to write a poem and to have a poem be a lecture. And I'm sure you all have seen a lot of spoken word, uh, where it might be a little lectury, which is fine, that's a style. But that's just something I personally uh, like to avoid as an author, and that's kind of where I put my poetic license. Uh, so hopefully, you know, that was some context for you there. Mm. Yeah, definitely. You you are showing us the poems. Obviously, it's your voice, every poem, right? Obviously. And they're not very long poems. So you don't have much time to fit in the tone and, and change the pace dramatically, but they are different pace-wise and they are different tone-wise. The first poem leaves us like off. Oh, literally, your ear is waiting for more words to come. You think he's taking a pause. He's not taking a pause. The poem is done, right? And that trick of the ear is something because now it's like, oh, I was literally like, ah, Ah, yes, that makes a lot of sense. So in your own poetry, we want you to practice a bit with this, okay? Now, obviously the spoken word event is open to everyone. We want to share, we want to have a good time. Don't worry about being a good poet and a long-standing poet, a poet who writes all the time. Just be a poet and come on in the room, okay? Come on in the room. I'm not going to share today. I'm going to save my sharing for next week. You want to hear me 
go from Bridget Robinson professor to Bridget Bianca poet, you got to come next week <laughs> and I'll be looking for you. Okay. I will be looking for you. Please write the word to your friends. I did drop a PDF in the chat with all the links and things and the today's prompts and all that business there. So you can grab that and have that for yourself. It'll also be available on the Live Guys website. Roxy's already put the link in the chat for us for that as well. I am so grateful for all of you. Thank you, Roxy. Thank you, Regis. Let's have a good Thursday and write some poetry. Okay. You are free to email me anytime about poetry. I will happily take it. Happily. All right. And maybe I'll see some of you all in the fall in English 38. You never know. All right, y'all. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.